Welcome to Credit and Bankruptcy with Reed Almond. Reclaim your power for financial independence. And now, your host, Reed Almond. Welcome back for another edition of Credit and Bankruptcy. I'm your host, Reed Almond, board certified consumer bankruptcy attorney by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. And we're here today to help you reclaim your power for financial independence. And we have a special guest that's gonna be helping us out today. Hey, Matt. Hey, Reed. Uh, happy to be back. Great. Looking forward to well, this one. Yeah. We've got a great topic today. We're gonna to be talking about auto loans and cars and how it's affected in bankruptcy, as well as issues related to your credit. So Matt, what is your initial impression when you hear somebody talking about filing a bankruptcy case and what's gonna happen with someone's car? I just assume everything gets taken away, right? I mean, that's the you're you're saying um, you can't pay, and I know this is a, an antiquated notion, but you're saying you can't pay your bills. Um, I would assume, well, you don't get to keep your you don't get to keep your car. Maybe you can't pay for your car. Um, I would just assume you you lose it and you have to go buy something really cheap, or I don't really know. But that's the first thing that comes to mind. That is exactly what a lot of our clients think when they come in. They'll tell me, hey, I need to file bankruptcy, but I can't lose this car. I love this car. I don't want to lose my car. Well, the good news is, is that if you file bankruptcy, you're not going to lose your car. So you are in the driver's seat, no pun intended, to be able to make those decisions and decide what's best for you and your vehicle and what you want to do going forward. It's our job here at Allman Law Firm to give you the advice and the knowledge to know these are my options and what are the pros and cons of each option and which way should I go? So if you don't file bankruptcy and you have an issue with your car, um, what do you do? What do you think, Matt? What do people do if they're having financial difficulty and they're not going to file bankruptcy? How do they resolve that? Um, I assume, I mean, the, one of the first steps you could do is maybe just call whoever you're paying the loan to um, and see if there's something you can work out. I don't know how often that works, but I assume that's at least a first step. I always... It's something I always tell my wife. I was like, you can you can always ask. Like, you know, the worst you're going to hear is no. Um, so would that be one of the steps that you could take? Yes, that's probably the first step. Um, a lot of times you're going to get a, a no, but sometimes uh, you do get a yes. And it may not fully resolve the issue that you're having, but you're right. It's worth asking. Some car loan creditors will allow you to have additional time to make the payment. Uh, they may allow you to do uh, something where they allow you to put the, the payment at the end of the car note so that you don't have to actually come up with it at all. Right now, you're just going to pay an additional month uh, longer than you would normally pay. And they may even do some payment plans with you. So that's a good place. And that's a good solution if you're having sort of a short term blip, something happened, why you couldn't make the car payment, and you're going to have smooth selling after that. If it's more of a sustained issue, like you have had your hours cut from full-time to part-time, or you have been diagnosed with some type of uh, illness, we're gonna have medical expenses, that kind of working with your car creditor for that kind of an issue, probably it's not gonna work out too well because they're only gonna be able to kind of do that quick fix, short thing. So you're right, that's the first thing. There's also something else a lot of people do. A lot of people will look at doing a couple things. Number one, They'll just say, I can't afford this anymore. It's not in my budget. I'm just going to give it back. And so credit wise, when you just surrender that, that's called a voluntary repossession, which has the same credit implications of having a repossession. So you're going to give that back to the creditor. And what they're going to do is they're going to take that and sell it at an auction. So let's say you owed 15,000 of the car, they sell it for 10. Now what happens to that $5,000 that's left over? Any idea, Matt? I'm guessing you're on the hook for it. I can't imagine you get away with that. Bingo. Yep. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people think, I gave the car back. What? Are, what are you, what's happening? So you may not hear from them the next day, the next week, maybe that year, but eventually you're going to be served a notice of a deficiency balance. So that $5,000 now, they're going to expect you to come out of pocket and pay for, for a car you don't have anymore. And if you can't pay for it, that may result in a lawsuit. And so you're talking about potentially having um, a constable or sheriff show up at your work, serve you a lawsuit about a car you don't have anymore. Um, and then you're going to have to figure out what you're going to do, work out a payment plan with them. So start making an additional payment on top of what the new car payment is you're trying to keep. Um, let's say best case scenario, they say, all right, 
we understand you can't afford this. We're going to forgive this. That sounds great, right, Matt? That sounds awesome. Yeah, you're yeah. going to give me a free car? or That, that sounds great. I'm all, all for that. So do you think there's any downside <laughs> if they say, hey, you know, we didn't get the 5000 We're just going to let you off the hook. Nothing could be wrong with that, right? I think there's probably a, a big, nothing in life is free, if, if, if that's one thing I've learned. Right. So if you owe more than $600 and that debt is forgiven, the person who owns that debt is required under law to file a 1099 with the IRS. So when they file that 1099 with the IRS, you're going to have to pay taxes. It's the same as if your employer paid you a $5,000 bonus. So now the debt may be gone, but now you just traded the debt that you had with Ford, Toyota, Sam's Auto, whoever it is. And now your new creditor is the IRS. And the IRS has lots of fun ways to collect money from you. That sounds a lot worse than owing uh, whoever your auto loan is through. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And so, um, so I know we're all depressed now and it's, <laughs> it's horrible. What are we going to do? Um, well, it gets worse. So let's say you do another option. They're like, okay, I'll, well, I don't want to pay these high payments. I don't want to have voluntary repossession. I know what I'll do. I will go and trade in this car for a new one. So what happens, Matt, when you go and take a car where you're $5,000 upside down on and get a new car? Um, I think you still owe that money. Uh, again, there's nothing that's free. Um, and so, yeah, having trying to sell a car that you still owe money on, that money's got to go somewhere. Um, so yeah, I assume whatever difference there is that probably just gets tacked onto your next loan. That's exactly what it is. So you have, you now take the new car purchase and you add an extra $5,000 on top of it. So now you've now taken that $5,000 and now you've re amortized it over a new three, five year, six, they're even doing seven, eight year loans now. And then you get to pay interest on top of that. So you may, and if you're in the double digits, we're talking about thousands of extra dollars on top of the 5,000. So none of these are good options. And so it's really important when you buy a car to take into consideration your budget, your monthly payment, and how this car um, depreciates over time. Because all cars are bad investments. They don't increase in value, they decrease in value. And they decrease very rapidly. So. Keep that in consideration. So now we've uh, kind of explored our non-bankruptcy options and none of them really sound that great. So let's talk about bankruptcy. So in a bankruptcy, we already kind of touched on, there's the fear that if you file, you're gonna lose your car and you're never gonna get it back. You're gonna be without a vehicle. You're never gonna be able to apply for a new loan. You're gonna get branded with the scarlet B of bankruptcy, it's over. So that's not true. So if you file a bankruptcy, you actually have four options available to you to deal with a car. Any guesses, Matt, on what those four are? Well, um, no, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't exactly have a guess. Um, so again, since I don't know a whole lot about the, the <clears throat> bankruptcy process, I assume one of them would be something uh, you know, similar to figuring out some sort of uh, payment plan or, or, or something like that. Uh, would I be correct in that? Yes. Okay. So I call them the four R's. And so I'll touch on those real, real quickly. So that is refinance through bankruptcy, redeem, reaffirm, or return. So those are the four R's that you typically have options available for you, for you in the bankruptcy. So I know one of those, return. You're just giving it back, right? Is, right. That, is that what happens? Right. But unlike outside of bankruptcy, if you return it, that $5,000 in our example we were using earlier is also wiped out as well. So you return the vehicle, but you walk away debt free. So you're not going to get sued for that on a judgment. You're not going to pay an IRS bill if it's forgiven, and you're not going to roll it into your next car. It's gone. So it's a much better option than your non-bankruptcy option of, of not doing that. Um, we also mentioned, you, you guessed correctly, that you maybe have a repayment plan available for you with that car. So how that works is in a chapter 13, which is a payment plan, we're able to take that vehicle and then pay for it over an extended period of time. You have the option as a consumer to pay either a three or five year plan. It's also dependent on how much income you make. So I'm not going to bore you with the details, but basically you're going to be in, in a bankruptcy plan from anywhere between three to five years. 
And so what we do is we look at that car and there's several strategic advantages that you have to refinancing the car through bankruptcy that you don't have if you're going to refinance it into a new car note. Number one, if you've had the car for more than 910 days from when you originally purchased it, we're able to have the bankruptcy amount included be the value of the car. So let me say that again. Let's use the same example we started off the beginning of the show. You have a car you owe 15,000 on, it's only worth 10. I've had the car now for more than 910 days, which is just shy of three years. I filed the bankruptcy case. How much am I gonna have to pay back to get clean title on this car? Uh, well, it's, so the amount you, the, the amount it's worth, the, right. the 10, which sounds like a pretty good deal. Yeah, it's a great deal. One, 30% of that car note is, is now gone. It's wiped out like it's a credit card bill. And the 10,000 now, we're gonna pay that back over a three to five year plan. So as you can imagine, if you're doing your budget and you've gone from full-time to part-time, you've taken a new job where you gotta cut and pay, you have new expenses, now we're gonna be able to shrink that payment down and make it more affordable for you and keep you in your car. So that is one big way we can help. But what if you've had the car for only a year or a year and a half or two years? Will bankruptcy help you at all? Yes, it will. So what we're gonna do is we can look at your interest and we can also, regardless of how long you've had the car, we can shorten your interest rate. And what we have to pay in interest typically is prime interest rate plus one point. So prime changes, but right now we're talking about 7% interest. So there may be a chance that when you purchase that car, you got 0% or 1% or 2%, you can still pay that interest rate. That's not a problem. But if you have a 19 or 20, or even I had a guy I was talking to the other day who had seen a car loan with 30% interest. Wow. I haven't even seen that. I've been doing it for 20 years. I've never seen that, but that wow. is apparently that's an option now. Then we can shave all that interest off and get you down into single digits. And that also translates into a lot better option for you regarding the monthly payments. So a chapter 13 is a great way to stop that. And we haven't really even talked about this either, but let's say you had already been working with your car creditor, like we talked about at the beginning of the show, and they agreed to give you two months of leeway. So you got two payments that you fell behind. The third month is coming up. They're like, okay, that's we can't offer anything else. We tried to work with you as best we can. You're three months behind, pay up or we're gonna repo. Whatever you're behind as of the date of filing, that all gets re-amortized too in the chapter 13 plan. And you don't have to start making a bankruptcy payment until a month later. So that really helps you if you have some type of short-term interruption, you're in between jobs or something's happened to not worry about the repossession. So I'm gonna throw another little question at you, Matt, here. So okay. let's say your car's been repossessed. Will bankruptcy get it back? Um, I'm, I'm I don't, I wouldn't think so, but I'm guessing there might be an option to do so, uh, just by the way you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> I've showed my hand. Okay. So, um, yes and no. So if the car has been repossessed in Texas, they hold the car for 10 days to see if you're going to redeem it. And so we're going to talk about redemption and bankruptcy. This is a different redemption term for under state law, which means if you're those three payments behind and they repossess it, if you could come up with the remaining balance owed on your loan and make a lump sum payment to that car creditor, you can pay them, get it out of the auction, clear title to it and walk away. But if you already have financial difficulties, most people don't have the money to just pay off the car note. But since you still have a property interest in that car, and if you file bankruptcy during this period, time period, the car creditor has to under federal law, let me repeat that, they have to give you the car back. And bankruptcy allows that to happen. So if your car has been repossessed and you've given up hope and you don't know what you're gonna do, you can't get approved for another one, you can't get your kids back to school, you can't get to work, now you're gonna lose your job, call us at 214-265-0123. We can file your bankruptcy case, send notice over to your car creditor, 
get a release of that vehicle and you can go down and pick that up from their car lot or you can go down to the auction and drive your car off the lot and keep it. So that is very rewarding and super powerful option that we have for our clients. So what about if the car was repossessed a month ago? Can we get it back if we file bankruptcy? It depends. If the car has not already been sold to somebody else and the creditor is still in possession of that property, you still have a property interest in it, we can file the bankruptcy case and get it back, but it's not a guarantee. So that's a little bit more of a touchy situation. So, so it really matters whether or not it's been sold yet right. at, at a certain point. Exactly. All right. That's the key point here. Um, but we usually like to really, everybody wants a guarantee and lawyers very rarely can give any guarantees. So we want to make sure that if the car is repossessed in the last 10 days, we get you in here and you don't delay and, and miss that opportunity. All right. So we, I said four R's. We've talked about refinancing through a chapter 13 bankruptcy case. We've talked about returning the vehicle and walking away debt free, which you can do in chapter seven or chapter 13. We have two more R's left. And those two R's are only available in chapter seven. So we've talked about all your options with your car under chapter 13. You get the drift um, that you can return it, walk away debt free. You can also refinance it, reduce the principal balance, reduce the interest balance, reduce how much you're having to pay monthly. Um, so let's say you do a chapter seven. All right, so let's take the first one, it's redemption. And so redemption seems a lot like how chapter 13 works with refinancing the car. And let me tell you why. So redemption means that we're able to look up the reasonable fair market value of your vehicle. And then you're able to then redeem the car by paying that balance. So to keep things simple and make sure we keep it the same kind of formula, let's still do the same topic where we have a car, we owe 15, it's worth 10, we wanna redeem it. How much do we have to pay to get it back? Uh, sounds like 10,000. You're right. So you would write a check for $10,000 after you follow chapter seven and you would get the title to that car. Matt, can you guess how many people actually have $10,000 after they file bankruptcy? I'm guessing not a lot. I, I would assume you probably don't have that. Right. Yeah. So that is correct. But there is a company out there that does redemption loan financing. And so what they will do, if you're eligible, they will review your income and you'll have to fill out a form. It's just like buying a car from anybody else. But you could take advantage of now refinancing that car outside of bankruptcy with a no car creditor and starting with the principal balance of 10,000 or whatever the car is worth. Now you are going to be paying a high interest rate, but when you look at the numbers and you see now I've got, I can pay this off. Typically it's within two, two years, maybe a little over two years and the payment is going to be less per month. And the total amount I'm going to be paying back, to the creditor is less. It's a win-win for many people. And I don't think you could walk to 10 people on the street and ask them if you could file bankruptcy on a chapter seven and reduce your car payment and reduce your principal balance, they would believe you. No, that, that doesn't sound like something that um, ought to happen. And I know part of uh, why you're doing the show is to just sort of bust some of those myths and, and, uh, and uh, a lot of people just think, well, if you're filing bankruptcy, then you don't get, you don't get freebies. You don't get things given to you. You, don't, you have to, you know, you have to pay what you owe, but it, it sounds like that's not necessarily the case. Right. You know, and I, I could tell by, you know, the, the way that you responded to that, you know, there's, there is, it kind of plays into another perception too, is that, you know, you're maybe pulling, maybe pulling a fast one on your creditors or maybe getting one over on them. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, I can understand why some people might think that. Um, but when you consider that a lot of the clients that I'm visiting with maybe got a very bad deal on the car, maybe if they'd gone to a different dealer, they would have got a much better sales price. Maybe they've got a super high interest rate, you know, and this car creditor now has made all their money back for the cost of the vehicle and, and some more, um, you know, then then this really is not really too bad of a deal for anyone because the alternative here is if the if you don't file bankruptcy 
and it gets repossessed, it's going to be sold at auction. And it's going to typically be sold for less than fair market value. But if you do the bankruptcy, you're going to pay fair market value. So actually the car creditor is going to make out better financially having you file bankruptcy and pay the market value through a redemption loan than if you didn't. Well, and you make a very good point about not necessarily getting a, a good deal. You know, having had to shop for a car, unfortunately, recently after a, a, an accident, I can tell you that uh, a number of places I went to um, were not necessarily dealing up front with me. And I knew if I went with them, I was like, I'm probably going to have a lot of trouble in, in the end, or I'm not going to get a very good deal here. So yeah, you know, you're not, not all auto loans are created equally. And um, if, if, part of this process is to level the playing field a little bit and say, look, you're paying a whole lot more than necessarily you need to. And there's, there's a fairer way to go about this. Then I think that's a good thing. Right. And so mainly I'm just saying this right now to give you permission to not feel guilty that typically the reason why you're having to file this case is something that's beyond your control. You didn't anticipate COVID happening and getting laid off. You didn't anticipate your child becoming ill and having to file bankruptcy. You didn't anticipate getting a divorce and losing half your income. So these things happen and there should be no guilt involved and, and no shame in taking advantage of your rights under bankruptcy law. And that's why you hire somebody like all law firm and like, like my firm um, is because we are here to advocate for you and make sure that you get the full maximum benefit under the law that you're entitled to. And these redemption loans are super helpful. And I hope that it's something maybe that you didn't know about and now you know about it and you can take advantage of that if it fits for you. So what is the other R? So we've done three R's. The chance of making you feel super annoyed that I'm gonna go over it again, I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyway. <laughs> the, th the three we've already talked about are return it and walk away debt free refinance it in a chapter 13 and redeem, redeem it, not redeem, uh, redeem it through the chapter seven. Can I get a drum roll? Final one, mm -hmm. reaffirmation. So that probably means nothing to you. Um, it didn't to me the first time I heard it. And so reaffirmation is a legal agreement between you and your creditor. And when you file a chapter seven bankruptcy case, your financial obligation on that car note is gone. You don't owe the money anymore. Now that does not remove the lien that's placed on the note by the lien holder, the car creditor. So the worst they can do is come and repossess the car. They can't ever ask you for any more money. So if you like that car, you're current on the car, you think you got a great deal, you don't want to return it, you don't want to redeem it. You don't want to refinance it through the bankruptcy. It's the perfect car for you. All you have to do is pay for it. So just keep making the payments every month and enter into what's called a reaffirmation agreement. So there's pros and cons of reaffirmation agreements, and it's not right for everyone. What are your, what do you think, Matt? So, I mean, it sounds like if I'm understanding correctly, uh, you just say, hey, I'm going through this bankruptcy process, but mm. I want to keep paying this loan as I always have been, you know, again, assuming that you're not missing payments and things like that. Um, I don't know. That seems like a pretty good deal. I'm, I'm curious to know what the, if you're able to do it, what the drawbacks of that would be and why you should or should not do that. Right. Okay. So let's get into that. Um, the, the worst situation that happened is it puts you in the same position that you were before you filed. So it's, it's not going to be any worse than what would you filed because the reaffirmation is reviving the original term. So you're basically entering into an agreement with the, with the car credit where you're saying, okay, I filed bankruptcy. I know the bankruptcy would give me the opportunity to walk away debt free and then give you back the car, but I don't want to do that. I like, I like you as a car creditor. I like the car. I want to keep the car. And so I want to keep you on the hook, requiring you to finish, you know, to honor the terms of our agreement and let me pay you. And I agree to be on the hook and agree to pay you. So the negatives of that are if you get in a car accident and that vehicle is totaled and it's now determined by the insurance company that it has a $10,000 salvage value, then the 5,000 that you still owed on that car note that was not paid on the $15,000 loan, you're still responsible for. 
you know, and so then you could still have that deficiency balance that we talked about. If a year after bankruptcy and you reaffirm the debt and you lose your job again, um, you're not eligible to refile a chapter seven, then you're going to get the car repossessed and then you're going to owe the same balance on that. So that's the negative is you're going to be in the same situation as you were before you filed. So what we do is we counsel our clients and we ask questions about, about the vehicle. Why do you need the vehicle? Is it reliable? Have you had any problems with it? Even though know, if it's a bad vehicle and everything is going wrong with it and you don't think that it's going to be operational and be able to fulfill your transportation needs over the remaining term of the loan, I'm going to advise you not to do the reaffirmation agreement. I'm going to advise you to return that vehicle. If you are severely upside down on the vehicle and you owe way more than what the car is worth, my advice is not to reaffirm on the debt. And when I give people that advice, uh, Matt, what do you think their, their fear is? If they, okay, well, okay, well, I guess I'll just return it. Then they're, they're thinking something, right? I, I'm assuming they're thinking they're not going to have a car anymore, which I guess would be partially correct. You know, yeah. you, you are returning this one. And, um, and I would think that uh, the average person who thinks they're going through bankruptcy thinks, well, I'm not going to be able to get another loan because I have this bankruptcy now. Um, and I'm not going to be able to keep the car because I'm, I'm returning it or they're, they're telling me I ought to. So yeah, that, that would be going through my head. Yeah. And that's exactly what's going through our clients heads. And that's the perception that people have is that if I file bankruptcy and I lose this car, I'm never getting another car. Forget cars. I'm never going to be able to buy a house. I'm never going to be able to do anything <clears throat> because I have this horrible bankruptcy on my credit. That's never going to go away. And I'm, I'm ruined. I'm financially ruined. I'm credit ruined credit wise. That's the perception. And that perception is totally false. And it's really hard for a lot of people to believe me when I say that which is why on future episodes, I'm going to invite some credit experts in here that do not work for me, that have their own businesses. And you can hear it directly from their mouth and not from mine. That is not the truth. And I'll bring in some clients as well. So you can hear from them what their personal experience was and how it worked for them. But the truth is, is that when you file for bankruptcy, it is a negative on your credit. But what you do immediately after the bankruptcy filing can help your credit improve within one to two years, your credit can potentially be better than it was before you filed. So circle back into the car. Okay. Let's say I tell you it's a bad deal. You are going to be able to purchase a car, a new car. If you're employed, um, immediately after you file the chapter seven bankruptcy case. Wow. I'm talking like the day after. There are banks out there, big banks, you know, Wells Fargo is a big bank. There's some other big banks out there that make these loans. I mean, you may be thinking like, why would somebody make a loan to somebody on a car that just filed for bankruptcy? Yeah, yeah, I would. I, I mean, uh, it seems counterintuitive uh, yeah. to me. Um, and I also assume probably, and you may get to this, that there's a higher interest rate attached to that, mm -hmm. I would I would assume. But uh, it does seem, even with that caveat, uh, not, not likely that you would be able to get a loan right afterwards. Well, so why would, so the answer to your question, why would they? There's a couple of reasons why. Number one, they understand bankruptcy law and they understand that 95, 99% of all chapter sevens receive a discharge. That once you file a chapter seven, especially if you're represented by an attorney, now if you're represented by yourself, the success rate is much lower, but if you're represented by a reputable attorney like on the law firm, almost 100% of our clients, 99.9% .9 get a discharge. And the reason is why that's significant is that all your liability, your unsecured liability is wiped out. So they know that you're not gonna have to worry with the stress of getting sued by your credit card company or trying to juggle, do I make my car note? Do I pay this credit card? Do I pay this medical bill? No, you're gonna be in a better financial situation after you file the bankruptcy case. And number two, if you get a bankruptcy discharge, there's a, a waiting period before you can file a new one. So you have to wait eight years from the date you filed the chapter seven and got a discharge before you can file a new one. Most co car loans are not eight years old. So they know now that unlike other car loans where you're worried, hey, they might file bankruptcy and I may not be able to get everything. This loan, 
that's not going to happen. I mean, they're going to get paid their money because bankruptcy is not an option. So it's actually a, a pretty good deal. You know, when you look at it, in which I think a lot of people assume financial institutions just look at one number and look at another number and they say yes or no. But when you think about it logically, you're looking at a person who is going to be in a better financial situation in terms of how much money they're bringing in and how much money they're having to pay out every every week. And you are guaranteed that they are going to, I mean, guaranteed, but they don't necessarily have a legal remedy to not pay off that full loan ahead of them. So yeah, when you think about it logically, it does make sense why there would be people out there who would who would do this. Okay. So that's what makes financial sense to the to the banks. And as soon as you file the bankruptcy case, you're gonna be receiving um, solicitations in the mail from car lenders offering to make you a loan. And we touched on this just a second ago, Matt brought this up. Well, what about the interest rate? Yes, the interest rate is gonna be higher. And so in, it'll probably be in the teens to high teens um, for that new purchase. And that may sound like a horrible deal because it most likely is a horrible deal for that interest rate. But we're talking about, we're getting the best deal we can at that time. So I mentioned that within a year after filing the bankruptcy, your credit might be better. So let's talk about that. When you retain all my law firm, unlike our competitors, uh, we offer some of our competitors, we offer a, a product with you. We pull your credit report, we pull all public records on you for any lawsuits. We pull a LexisNexis search to see if you have any liens against you. And also we pull a credit product. And so what that means is that we tell you what your credit score is as the day that we pull that report. And it has a predictive algorithm that tells you what your score could be one year after filing the bankruptcy case if you do X, Y, and Z. And those terms are spelled out in that product. And any guesses on how people's credit is affected afterwards? Do you think it goes up or goes down one year after the bankruptcy? Well, it sounds like you're saying it, it goes up. And I, I do find that surprising. Again, the common, um, I guess, misconception at this point is that if you uh, file a bankruptcy, you're going to be dealing with that for years on your, on your you know, that, that's going to hurt you for a very long time. But um, I guess that's not the case. Right. So we've looked at this and we looked at our clients uh, for these reports and the average credit score increases between 50 to 100 points higher one year after bankruptcy than it was before you filed. And so let me tell you why that might be the case. Number one, your credit score is based on multiple factors. Number one, you got debt to income ratio. So the amount of debts you have after the bankruptcy is gonna be significantly lower. So that ratio is improved. Number two, we look at derogatory information on your credit report. So if you have a credit card where you're six months behind and you've been paying it late for six months, that negative derogatory information is gonna stay on your credit report every single month until it falls off. If you had a charge off or some other negative, it's gonna stay on there too. And also they look at your capacity. Let's say that you have been granted a $10,000 credit line and you have used all 10,000, your capacity is zero. That also affects your credit score. So now what happens after bankruptcy? So after bankruptcy, we know the debt's wiped out. We know that, so that improves your debt to income ratio. We know that all the derogatory information for those car creditors, they can't keep on reporting negative stuff on your case after the bankruptcy. All they can report is discharge and bankruptcy. So that's negative for one month, but the month after that and the month after that, they're not gonna report anything negative. And we also know that if you get a secured car, a secure credit card, or you get a new car loan, like I mean, what we're just talking about, we're just talking about a car loan, right? And the negative was the higher interest rate. If you get a car loan and you make those payments on time for one year, you're rebuilding your credit. They're getting positive information on your score. When you do that for one year, that's why your score goes up. And one year after bankruptcy, if your credit score is 100 points higher than it was when you filed and you got a car loan and it's in the high teens, any guesses on what you can do one year after bankruptcy? Uh, you could, I assume, get another loan or buy a different car or, or um, probably any, any number of things. You can, you're, if you're in a better position, you, there's a lot of things open to you. Right. That's exactly right. So you now can get a new car loan and you can roll in any balance you have on that car, which if you've only had it for a year and you got it at a good price, you're probably not going to have too much of a deficiency balance on that car. 
you're going to be able to get approved for a new car with a lower interest rate. You can also potentially refinance the current car you have and refinance it for a lower interest rate with that higher credit score. So now we've effectively negated the one negative that we had about getting a car loan after bankruptcy, which was the higher interest rate. So, and we've used that new car purchase as a tool that helped us rebuild our credit. So it is absolutely possible to get approved for a car after bankruptcy. And in some cases, it's an extremely wise decision credit credit wise for you. So a good, a good, um strategy then would be to take this higher interest loan, maybe go buy a cheaper car, one that that uh, maybe a used car or, or something like that, that may only give you a couple of years. But if you're looking at it a year down the road, and I'm going to be in a p better position, um, if I don't spend a lot now, I can potentially go and get the car that I actually want a year or two from now, and I'll be in a pretty good spot. That is an incredibly wise decision to make. And so we recommend our clients go and purchase, you know, not the dream car, but a reliable car that's gonna hold its value. So you're looking at Toyota Camry, an Accord, a Honda, you know, Honda Accord or whatever. Um, those cars are reliable and they hold their value well. And we're lo not looking to make the dream purchase after filing bankruptcy. We're looking to get from point A to point B. And if you do make those decisions and you put in the work for that amount of time, then you're going to be able to maybe get the, the car that you want um, afterwards at a much better interest rate. And having done this for 20 years and seeing people, I can tell you bad decision making on car purchases is it may be up there as the number one mistake that people make that really help that ruins them financially. Because as we started off this show, there's not really very many good options. If you make a bad car purchase and you get more car than you need, or you get a bad deal where you're paying more than what it's worth, you have very limited options of, other than just to suck it up and finish paying for that. Because if you do anything else, it's gonna, it's gonna be a bad situation for you. So make those smart decisions, get yourself in a situation on a car that's gonna work for you. I wanna circle back for one second and talk just a little bit more about reaffirmation agreements. Because I told you when you should do it and when you shouldn't do it and who is this for and what are those options. But what I haven't done is, let's say, you know, you're a current Almond Law client and you're considering doing the reaffirmation. We've made a decision. You've decided, hey, this is in my best interest. What do we, how do we get that done? What are the steps? So number one, you retain our firm to negotiate with a car creditor. We're going to negotiate the terms to get that uh, agreement reaffirmed and get that from the creditor. This requires a lot more effort than what you might think. We have to list it on your bankruptcy schedules that your intention is to reaffirm the debt. We then have to communicate with the car creditor and request the reaffirmation agreement. We have to get them to deliver that to us. We inspect the agreement and make sure that it's in compliance with the bankruptcy provisions and is a good deal for you. Then we get the agreement to you. You review the agreement and you sign it. Then you have to return the agreement to us then we sign it and finally we return it to the creditor. Now, once it gets to the creditor, they sign it and file it with the court. Exhausted? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a lot of back and forth and there's not a whole lot of time to do it. So once you retain us for that, we, we file the case, we have to get started on that right away and we have to get that back and we need to, um, you as a potential client who's in this process to get that back to us very quickly so we can get that filed with the court. Once it's filed with the court, then it is now going to be effective after the bankruptcy discharge. So that is kind of the X's and O's of how the reaffirmation process works. So Matt, is your head swimming? Are you uh, confused? <laughs> a little bit. Like uh, I, I understand a little of this stuff going in and I think I'm more confused now. Although I do, I, I think the big takeaway, and I think this is going to be the thing mm -hmm. that I keep learning as this show goes on, is that while bankruptcy is not a not a pleasant thing necessarily to go through um and or, or the reasons for it are not necessarily pleasant it is not as bad as you think it is and there are benefits to you afterwards that you may not expect and the car thing i mean, I think a lot of people look at look at car i mean and i think rightfully so cars are are a luxury and you wouldn't think well gosh surely i'm not going to be allowed or maybe i'm just going to have to go buy one for 500 bucks that i see on the side of the road like that's the best i can do but uh you have a lot more options available to you than you might expect. Right. 
I mean, the best option is to is to not lose a job or have inter interruption income or or have financial difficulties. Um, so that is the best option. But if you do have those, oftentimes bankruptcy is going to be the better option than doing nothing. Because there is a do nothing option and we go over that during our, our consultations and we say, if you don't file bankruptcy, here's what's gonna happen. And we talked about that at the beginning of the show and it was super depressing. I mean, because if you don't, if your car creditor won't work with you and you can't pay them, you give the car back, now you got a repossession, you got somebody hounding you for money and serving you a lawsuit. And even if you get the best possible outcome, they forgive the debt, now you owe the IRS. So the do nothing option is much worse than the do something option that we talked about here with bankruptcy. And that's what I wanna get across to you. And I'm talking to you right now, whoever's watching this. You may be watching this, I assume, because this applies to you. Maybe you're having financial difficulties right now and you want to know what's available for you. And that's why we're here. So you can give us a call at 214-265-0123. We're here standing by to take your calls. You can also visit with us virtually through our website, through our portal, and we're gonna go through all your options. We're gonna go through your non-bankruptcy options, just like we did here with this car segment. We're gonna go through your bankruptcy options, and then it's your choice. There's no obligation, there's no high pressure. Our job here, like I talked about when we started the show, was we want to help you reclaim your power for financial independence. And how do you reclaim your power? You have to have the knowledge so you can make an informed legal decision. And I hope today, even though it might've been confusing, that we accomplished our goal to give you knowledge, to put you in a situation to make a smart decision about your finances. So I wanna thank everybody for giving us their time today. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see you on the next segment and show for credit and bankruptcy. Have a wonderful day.